to lift the waters above from the waters below. Now, you're saying, what in the world is this? Now stop, and this is the key to understanding ancient texts. When we read an ancient text, we have to respect it. We have to read it and think through the mindset of ancient peoples. And put yourself back in the ancient world. Put yourself back in the ancient world and look up at the heavens and what do you see? A great big blue dome. And occasionally it rains, water falls from above. So to suggest that there was a sea of water overhead makes perfect, perfect sense from an ancient perspective. As we all know, that song, dance like an Egyptian, walk like an Egyptian, we gotta think like an Egyptian. And if we go on to the fourth day of creation in Genesis 1, you'll see that God puts the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament. Isn't that what it looks like? The sun, moon, and stars seem to be embedded right in front of that blue dome, that blue sea of water. So from an ancient perspective, this makes perfect sense in fact, this was the very best science of the day. Now you'll notice when it comes to the earth, it looks like the earth is an island with water all around. Why would that be? Well again, you have to think like an ancient, especially an ancient in the ancient Near Eastern world. And think about the local geography. Ancient peoples didn't travel very far. Most didn't travel much more than 20 miles from where they were born. However, there were some people who traveled, and they traveled in all directions. And what did they hit? They came to a body of water in all directions. So to suggest that there's water all around them made perfect sense from their experience. In fact, we have archaeological evidence from the 6th century BC which shows the Babylonian understanding of the world. It's an entire world map. So what you see is there is a circular earth that is surrounded by a circumferential sea. So from their perspective, again, this makes perfect sense. This ancient understanding of geography even appears in the Bible. Take, for example, when God called Abraham to the promised land. In Isaiah 41, he calls him from the ends of the earth from the very edges of the earth. And so, from an ancient Near Eastern perspective, Ur was indeed that very edge of the world. But of course, from our perspective, Ur is just at the edge of the Persian Gulf. Even Jesus used ancient geography in order to communicate as effectively as possible with people in his generation. In other words, Jesus came down to their level so he could be understood. For example, he talks about the Queen of Sheba coming from the ends of the earth and going to meet Solomon in Jerusalem to learn wisdom from him. And where is Sheba? Well, from their ancient perspective, being near the shoreline, they thought that Sheba was at the ends of the earth. And from their perspective, that made perfect sense. And the third feature we find in Genesis 1 to 11 is ancient poetry. For those of you who've been reading the Bible for many years, in particular Noah's flood account, have you ever noticed this magnificent poetic structure called a chiasm? The way it's structured is it repeats things. So you'll see A, Noah and his sons go down to the bottom, 
a prime, known as suns. So it goes back and forth and back and forth. And the whole idea of a chiastic structure is to focus you into the center of the chiasm where you find the moral of the story. In other words, the most important principle to be taught, which in the case of the flood account is God remembers Noah. In other words, Noah is the only righteous individual and God will remember the righteous individual in the myths of his judging the world. A couple other features to note. You'll see that numbers are repeating. And in particular, the number seven, which is a mystical number in the ancient world, and so too is the number 40. Both these numbers are numbers of completion and the repetition of the number 150. Now, in the light of this amazing structure, we can ask a pretty challenging question. Is this historical? Does history unfold in chiastic structures? For example, the history of our nation. Does it unfold in such a fashion? I think we all know the answer. Well, let's get on to Genesis 1, the first chapter of the Bible. And we're going to discover an amazing poetic structure, a pair of parallel panels. The Bible begins in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. The original Hebrew for these two words is tohu, bohu. Now, this rhyming would have caught the attention of the readers and listeners of Genesis 1. And so what God does is God solves the problem of formlessness and emptiness, where in the first three days, he solves the formlessness problem. And in the next three days, he solves the emptiness problem. So what we find on day one, is God separates light and darkness by the creation of light. On day two, God separates the waters above from waters below by the firmament. And on day three, God separates dry land from the seas. So what we find here in the first three days is we've solved this formlessness problem. Now, God is going to fill the world with wonderful things. And not only that, it's going to be in alignment to what has already been created on the other side of the panel, of the parallel panel. So on day four, you have the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. Why? Because it aligns up with the light that was created on day one. Which brings us to an interesting point. I often hear people criticizing the Bible, saying, look, at light's created on day one, but the sun's on day four. This doesn't make any sense. Well, here's a problem as far as I'm concerned. These individuals are failing to respect, and I'm going to repeat that, to respect the poetic structure we find here in Genesis 1. What's really going on here is the author is setting up the creation events according to the panels. Instead of offering a fact after fact after fact historical type event in the creation of the world. Well, let's move on to day five. Have you ever noticed we have flying creatures and sea creatures being made. What's their biological connection? Or in other words, is there a taxonomical connection? And the answer is, no, there isn't from a biological perspective. But from a poetic perspective, it makes perfect sense. Because look across. What did you get created on day two? You had the waters above being separated from the waters below to create an empty airspace for who? the flying creatures. And with the waters below being defined, what do we have? We have a place in which we can put the sea creatures. And finally, on day six, you have dry land for land animals and humans. And then finally, on the seventh day, and I really think this is the key to Genesis 1, is God rests. There's a subtle message here. After our six days of working and laboring during the week, we need